please find a seat. There are seats in front. If anybody in the back who isn't in the, um, in the infirmary, I hear there's a little section there for those who are uh, working on their wellness. But the rest of you, please uh, feel free to move your seats and, and come forward. My name is Sylvia Alva. I'm Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Cal Poly Pomona. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our inaugural Academic Affairs Forum. When I first started here uh, a year ago or so, over a year ago, uh, I learned that there was a tradition of the provost running to each of the colleges to give a quick welcome. And I thought to myself, that is not uh, easy for someone who likes to wear heels. And so I thought about uh, I thought about a different model that was more in keeping with uh, my own hope of creating a sense of place, a sense of community, a sense of shared direction for academic affairs. And so uh, my leadership team and I put our heads together and came up with uh, this forum and the format. I, ho I hope you like it. I welcome your feedback and I hope it becomes a uh, part of the Cal Poly tradition. Speaking of tradition, I'm uh, starting my 27th year in the CSU. It's pretty amazing. And that doesn't include the years I spent as an undergraduate as a, at a CSU campus. But I'm only in my second year here at Pro, as provost at Cal Poly Pomona. And, and I'm marking that with uh, my uh, two anniversary pins. Uh, at commencement, I was really taken by uh, the few students who I saw at commencement who marked their time at Cal Poly Pomona by wearing a lanyard of parking permits around their neck. And, uh, that is what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping uh, that the pins will eventually become a full lanyard and will mark uh, each year with a, with a commemorative pin. As I mentioned earlier, I've been on several CSU campuses, both professionally as well as a visitor. And, and let me just state the obvious. Um, this is a beautiful campus. Uh, what, don't you agree? I often find myself stopping to gaze at these incredible panoramic views of the campus and surrounding area. I, found my, I find myself admiring the architecture. I find myself uh, really just being jealous and happy that uh, we are, not jealous, but jealous of others who don't have uh, these beautiful horses that greet them as, as we drive onto the campus. But I'll tell you, what really makes Cal Poly Pomona a very special place is the warm and welcoming people who embody and embrace our mission. And I'm talking about you. I wanna thank each and every one of you for welcoming me to Cal Poly Pomona. I feel deeply honored to serve as your provost and look forward to continuing to meet more and more of you and engage all of you in the important work that lies ahead for us here at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, this year, we will be working on a number of university-wide and academic affairs initiatives. And I wanted to spend some time focusing on those goals so that you, you have a sense of the strategic direction that we want to take and think about how you can come on board and help participate in our success in reaching those goals. Uh, I am deeply committed to moving the organization to become much more strategic in our thinking. And you know, strategy, strategic thinking is often thrown out there, and it's not always clear what we mean by that. For me, when I think of being strategic, I think of being intentional. I think of being purposeful. I think of being integrated. And so I look forward to engaging you and the rest of the cabinet and the university in efforts that will move us towards being much more engaged, much more integrated, purposeful, 
and intentional in our work. What you see here are the six goals that I have outlined for academic affairs. These are long-term goals, and each year I see us taking these long-term goals and refining them, but also expressing them in short-term annual goals. And so I'd like to take each of them in, in turn and not provide a comprehensive overview, but enough to give you a sense of uh, what we will be focusing on this year in, in academic affairs. So the first goal is Cal Poly Pomona will offer high quality academic programs that reflect our polytechnic identity and that are regionally and nationally recognized. I am a firm believer that in academic affairs, our academic programs are our hallmark. It's our bread and butter. And so whatever it is that we do, we must always work to elevate the academic program. And so this year, we have two major initiatives in this area that I want to bring to your attention. In November, we will be launching the academic master planning process. Now, many of you are, are, are asking yourself, what is an academic master plan? Let me begin by saying what it is not. An academic master plan is not a program priorita prioritization process. It's even hard to say that word. It is not program prioritization. It is also not program elimination. What an academic master plan is, is an expression of our collective vision of where we want to take our academic programs. What programs do we want to grow? What programs do we want to expand on? And if we want to further express that polytechnic identity, what are the features, what are the elements that need to be common in our courses, in the experience of our students to give further expression to what we mean by a polytechnic identity? So the academic master plan will be a collective conversation that will help us frame these important uh, decisions about who, who, we, who we are, who we want to be both in terms of our student composition as well as our academic programs. As we talk about our student composition, I want to take an opportunity to welcome the newest members to academic affairs. This July, we brought over uh, all of enrollment services to academic affairs, and I want to take a moment to ask all of our newest members from Enrollment Services, led by Kathy Street, to please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to Academic Affairs. The next uh, major goal for us is that Cal Poly Pomona will meet and exceed the CSU graduation rates set for the campus and eliminate the achievement gap. That is a very, very ambitious goal. It's not something that we will do in a year, but you certainly have to have the long view in order to know how you're going to strategically move in that direction. Uh, I want to spend a little, well, spend a little time in my, later in my presentation talking about the Graduation Initiative 2025 and some of the ideas that we have percolating in that area. So I'll leave that, that, this part of the program for a little later. The next goal is that Cal Poly Pomona will successfully transition the academic programs, courses, policies from quarter to semester in fall of 2018. I know that this has been work that you have been embarked on even before I've gotten here, and I want to express to the Academic Senate, to members of my own leadership team, 
how grateful I am that we have made tremendous progress in moving the curriculum from quarter to semester and having it go through a comprehensive review. We are well ahead of schedule on this front, and that is really important because what it does is it gives us time to do some fine tuning and to model and anticipate what it will look like when we move from quarter to semester. I also think that those of us who have roles other than teaching recognize that there is a lot of other work that needs to be carefully considered when we think about uh, quarter to semester transitions. Yesterday in our uh, uh, wider forum, uh, John McGuthrie talked about uh, the transition uh, being almost parallel to the Y2K transition, right? There was a lot of work that went on behind the scenes to ensure that uh, Y2K, uh, when we moved to 2000, that the computers wouldn't crash and that the clocks would still work. Well, there are people who stay up at night worrying about the fact that uh, we are going to make a major transition in fall of 2018, and we cannot have a misstep. It's got to be like the Y2K incident, a non-event. And so I want to, again, express my deep appreciation for everyone who's been working so hard to make this uh, transition a smooth one and look forward to continuing to, to mark the progress that you're making. The next um, goal is to build a culture of strategic enrollment management that aligns with and supports the graduation initiative and our commitment to access, inclusion, and excellence. I'm thrilled that Enrollment Services is with us. It gives us an opportunity to work hand in hand with uh, this important part of the institution to ensure that the academic program, the courses, the schedule, all serve our students. And that similarly, as we enroll students, there is a place for them on, in the curriculum. And that requires new tools, new approaches, and I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that we have in place the tools and the information to make strategic and informed decisions. Uh, the next goal is to continue to cultivate the teacher-scholar model. The, the, the model is at the core of our identity. What I'd like to see us do is to find ways to further engage students both in the teaching as well as in the scholar part of the teacher scholar. And so this is a very important part of our mission and I look forward to continuing to give further expression to what we know is clearly a high impact practice. And lastly, we know that any change cannot be achieved without good people. And so the last goal for us in academic affairs is to build high performing teams and a learning-centered and strategic organization. I love to work in teams. When I look back at my career, some of the highlights of my own career have been when I've had the opportunity to work in cross-divisional and cross-functional teams to create something that alone we couldn't create, but together we can en envision and create together. So I look forward to creating that kind of environment where we are creative, we're innovative, uh, and working to make the organization uh, even better than it is today. And that means investing in people. It means investing in uh, team members. And I look forward to uh, continuing to provide workshops and information sessions on this area. Just to mention too, on October 3rd, Academic Affairs will be sponsoring uh, Professor Daryl Smith from the Claremont Graduate School. She will be talking about diversity in higher education. And we'll, we will be sending more of this information out to you. But October, check my notes here, October 5th is the date that, that my little uh, third or fifth, my notes are, don't, don't count on this lecture to give you the date. We'll send you good information. Um, the fifth, thank you, Seb. Similarly, we will be sponsoring with the CFA a uh, workshop, an 
unconscious bias, and we've scheduled that for October 28th. So you can see we've got a very ambitious year. There's a lot uh, that we are working on. Uh, this Friday, I want to also personally invite all of you to a conversation with Dr. La Larry Abel. He is a uh, provost emeritus from Florida State U University. And under his leadership, they have dramatically improved their graduation rates. And he will be engaging the campus in a conversation about what they did to see if there are things that we can pick up from Florida State uh, and try here, or more importantly, recognize what is working here and continue to build and expand on some of our own best practices. So with that, you can see we've got a very ambitious year. My success depends on your engagement. I look forward to engaging you, involving you in the strategic direction of academic affairs. So thank you very much. We're going to move to a slightly different part of the program. Uh, before we move to that section of the program, I would like to ask that we observe a moment of silence to recognize a beloved and special faculty member that we lost this last year. Anthropology professor Kun Chen, whom colleagues describe as a dedicated mentor to her students and a pioneering researcher in her field, passed away in October 2015. She began teaching at Cal Poly Pomona in 2011 after completing her doctorate from UC Berkeley. Thank you. In life and the passage of life, there are people who have a special calling and passion to make the world a better place. There's a beautiful poem, Two Tramps in Mud Time, by Robert Frost that captures this sentiment so eloquently. Here are a few lines from Robert Frost's poem. My object in living is to unite. My avocation and my vocation as my two eyes become one in sight. Only where love and need are one and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes. Let us always strive to unite our avocation with our vocation. With that message in mind, I am thrilled to share with you that this year we hired a record number of tenure-track faculty at Cal Poly Pomona. A total of 53 new tenure-track faculty will be joining us this year. Uh, at this time, join me in welcoming the newest members of our campus community. stand when you see your name. Exciting. 
Well, welcome aboard. I saw a number of name tags for the new faculty, and if you remember what it's like to be a new faculty member, there is no doubt in my mind that they are busily working on their syllabus and figuring out what key opens their office door, and uh, there's just a lot that, that happens that first year. So those of you who were able to join us today, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Cal Poly uh, Pomona family and community. Um, I'd like to now ask if there are any new staff members who are here who joined the team this past year, and will you please stand? Thank you. I'd like to uh, also, I identify a few key members of my leadership team. Uh, this year we're joined by Eric Rowland, who will, came in as the incoming Dean of the College of Business Administration. <laughs> Allison Baskey, the Dean of the College of Science. Sadiq Shah, the Associate Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Economic Development. And Sepp Eskandari, who joins us as the Interim Associate Vice President for Academic Planning and Faculty Affairs. We've got a phenomenal team, and I'm really looking forward to uh, serving you, and I know that they are excited to be par part of the Cal Poly Pomona tradition. Um, grants and contracts awarded to faculty based on their research and professional expertise provide non-state funds to further our commitment to our mission and goals. These funds provide valuable opportunities for faculty and students to engage in research, to travel to professional conferences, to give presentations, to purchase new equipment, to publish their scholarly and creative work. All of, the, all of these opportunities and many more are made possible by external funding. Dr. Shaw, no pressure, but I'd like to see us double those numbers. I think we have the talent, we have the experience, we have the programs to do that. And so I look forward to uh, continuing to expand the list of awarded grants and contracts here at Cal Poly Pomona. Now I'd like to uh, recognize the outstanding advisors, staff, and advising programs. Outstanding faculty advisors, Valerie Milano, Plant Science, College of Agriculture. James Jared Oakley, International Business and Marketing, College of Business Administration. Betty Alford, Education, College of Education and Integrative Studies. Sabod Bandari, Aerospace Engineering, College of Engineering. Andrew Wilcox, Landscape Architecture, College of Environmental Design. Donald St. Hilaire, Hospitality Management, the Collins College of Hospitality Management. Mario Guerrero, Political Science, College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. 
Jasha Polet, Geological Sciences College of Science. Outstanding Staff Advisor, Rebecca Brasenio, Liberal Studies, College of Education and Integrative Studies. Outstanding Advising Programs, Poly Transfer, College of Education and Integrative Studies. Center for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching, College of Science. Do we do it now? So I just got word that I think we uh, skipped a slide. So I want to, in addition to welcoming the new faculty, I want to recognize the faculty who secured tenure and promotion this past year. So you, can you please uh, modify the program? Pretty impressive, wouldn't you say? I also want to thank the, the deans, uh, the mentors, all of the folks who helped uh, these uh, individuals both arrive here, but also reach these important hallmarks in their career. It takes a collective commitment to ensuring the success of a faculty member. And again, I want to just thank all of you for being tremendous mentors, advisors, and champions of our faculty. Thank you. At Cal Poly Pomona, the most prestigious award is the faculty member can achieve is the Provost Award for Excellence. After undergoing a, rigor, ah, a rigorous selection process, three awards are given each year to exceptional faculty members for their excellence in teaching, excellence in service, and excellence in scholarly and creative activities. Recipients of the Award for Excellence in Teaching demonstrate outstanding classroom performance by providing students with new innovative content, and they also play an active role in students' education outside of the classroom. Recipients of the Award for Excellence in Service show exemplary contributions both in and outside of the classroom in ways that benefit their departments, their colleges, their profession, and the university. Award recipients for the excellence in scholarly and creative activity advance knowledge through investigation and analysis and publication of their work, and they also celebrate original artistic endeavors. The Provost Award for Excellence recipients are recognized at commencement. Their work is showcased annually at a university symposium they receive a monetary award, and their name remains in perpetuity on the Provost Award for Excellence wall in the University Library. Let's turn our attention to the 2015-16 winners of the Provost Awards for Excellence. And so, interestingly, to receive a service award means that I'm receiving an award for something that I'm motivated to do, because service uh, at its core is to help other people. The value of teaching, I guess, ultimately is to um, look towards the future. We want to pass on that information to our students, to give students tools to ultimately benefit society. 
Probably the major thing that I'm known for nationally is my writing on multicultural psychology. Um, I do have a textbook that I believe is the number one undergraduate textbook in the country. And, I mean, ultimately I've done a lot of service throughout my career. I, I review a lot of manuscripts for professional journals. I've served as president of various organizations. Just recently I, I, I got appointed as the executive officer of the Western Psychological Association. And I'm the director of the Marital and Family Therapy Program. I was one of the founding members of the IRB committee and for the last uh, six and a half years I've been the chair of the IRB committee. The service I do for the profession gives Cal Poly some note. So like when I uh, review manuscripts for journals and I, I'm on editorial boards, Cal Poly's name is next to my name. To the extent that um, I could help um, get the word out about um, the hidden jewel here at Cal Poly, um, that's both fulfilling for me and beneficial for the university that Cal Poly gets exposure, it attracts better students. We give value added as professors to students and then students uh, go out and they help society move forward. I, I never actually really sought to be a leader and I never really considered myself to be a leader. But what ended up happening was is that I saw a need. Ultimately, I saw leadership as service. I'm serving my community. What motivates me? The possibility of finding something new. I think that's, that's the real um, payoff in, in research, is when you discover something new. I'm involved in research that looks at the sperms, sperm cells of a tiny worm to identify genes that are involved in the activation of sperm. We have named two genes in that process and discovered their functions. We have been able to study a number of other genes that were already known but add to what we know about their function. And many of them have human counterparts. Genes that are involved in the sperm cell activation in my organism are similar to genes that are, say, um, involved in Alzheimer's in humans. You can also bring your students into the research, and I think that's an incredibly important aspect of it. I involve students in my research, and I, I, I love to be in the lab side by side with my students. I really look forward to a daily interaction with them, and I have typically between three and six students working in my lab at any one time. Those students take part in every aspect, developing projects, writing the project, presenting their research. I guess I'm most proud of the fact that I have received almost continuous grant support over almost the entirety of my career. To me, there's no better demonstration that your research is important than if somebody's going to give you money to do it. So that is, is the thing that I think I'm, I'm most proud of in terms of my overall career that, that it, it is having an impact and that demonstrates it. I think being an educator we have the ability to shape the future by helping our students to shape their future. My primary role is being there for students, help students learn. I also do a lot of research work with my students. My interest is in the area of biomimicry. I love my students going out to the nature, looking for organisms, learning from them and bringing them back into the design. I am involved in multiple outreach projects. Uh, I have my students and myself going to local elementary schools, middle schools, and we, we teach robotics. I also work with a program called Feminier, which is for female engineers. Uh, so we go to high school girls and help them to learn, inspire, and empower them 
ready for engineering or any other college studies. As, as I got into engineering, I got really excited about the field of engineering. Um, I saw the things that you can accomplish with the engineering. And I see everything that you use today or that we consume today is all thanks to engineering. Engineering is all about creating that ex things that make our life safer, more comfortable and better. That's what makes me get excited about engineering and this is what I tell my students so they get excited about engineering. The only way you can acquire knowledge is by experience and my goal as a teacher is to, is to provide that experience. So in my class, I make sure all my students are engaged in different ways. It could be a hands-on learning experience, it could be a thought experiment, it could be an activity, it could be a listening, but everything is connected to the real world, so they put themselves in that situation. And if you can provide that experience to the students, that learning experience, that is knowledge. I think you are reaching out to the students and they are going to think beyond the exams, beyond your lecture, they are going to look a bigger picture of why they are here, why they want to learn. And if you can provide that experience, I think that is excellence in teaching. I think I saw Professor Lamornian here. I know uh, Professor Mio mentioned to me that he's not able to be here, that he's on sabbatical this term. Is, uh, are any of our provost awardees here? Please stand and be recognized. When you think about the work in academic affairs, there really are three pillars, teaching, service, and scholarly and creative activity. And these faculty really exemplify the very, very best that Cal Poly Pomona has to offer. I think the glue that brings these three pillars together is a commitment to shared governance. And that leads me to our next presentation. Each year, the George P. Hart Award for Outstanding Faculty Leadership is awarded to a faculty member who has demonstrated the highest tradition of academic life and the outstanding personal qualities that endeared Professor Hart to the university community. Chosen by a committee of peers, the Hart Awardee is announced annually at Fall Conference. The awardee receives a monetary award along with a plaque from President Coley. I am pleased now to reveal this year's recipient of the George P. Hart Award for Outstanding Faculty Leadership. Hello, my name is Julie Shen. I'm the Acting Chair of the Academic Senate at Cal Poly Pomona. The George P. Hart Award for Outstanding Faculty Leadership was created in 1996 by Professor Hart's widow, his many friends, and the university as a living memorial to his many outstanding qualities. A beloved teacher and highly regarded colleague, Professor Hart devoted 30 years to Cal Poly Pomona as a member of the Political Science Department, as Associate Dean in the College of Arts, as a member and chair of the Academic Senate, and as a member of the California State University Academic Senate. Professor Hart cared deeply about Cal Poly Pomona, and his life serves as a tribute to the pursuit of academic excellence and dedicated leadership. This year, I'm very pleased to announce that the George P. Hart Award for Outstanding Faculty Leadership will be awarded to a faculty member who displays the highest traditions of academic life and the outstanding personal qualities that endeared Professor Hart to the Cal Poly Pomona community. This year's honoree is Professor Mahmoud Ibrahim of the History Department in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. Congratulations, Professor Ibrahim. Thank you very much. I am honored to receive the 2016 George P. Hart Award. I am delighted by such recognition, and I would like to thank members of the selection committee themselves, previous Hart awardees, and those who nominated me and wrote letters in my support. I have the distinct privilege of serving on the Academic Senate along with Dr. Hart. 
In truth, I did not know what to expect by running for election to the Senate, but I was unopposed and thus elected by default. <laughs> I was a new senator and still fairly new to Cal Poly Pomona. It was learning by doing, as we say. But our close discipline and our shared space on the third floor of Building 94 made George instantly familiar in those unfamiliar surroundings. I was particularly impressed by the seriousness with which George listened to the other side of the debate and how he carefully considered the opposing view before he spoke. I can almost see him turning the idea around in his head as he would remove his very delicate glasses and wipe them tenderly, put them back on, and all the while George is focused on how such a policy or a position would serve the best interest of our students and faculty. I would listen intently to his calm and deep, resonating voice, articulating reasoned, methodical, and thoughtful interventions. He was indeed the model of collegiality. When George Hart became chair of the Senate, he appointed me to chair the Faculty Affairs Committee. Frankly, I had not even considered at the time chairing any committee, let alone such an important one whose task was to develop the criteria and the process for implementing merit pay. I must have looked like someone who either had a panic attack or one that said, are you sure? He smiled, uh, almost chuckled and nodded, assuring me that I could do it. Of course, now I know that these are committee decisions, but that gesture cemented a long relationship with the Academic Senate, a relationship that spans my career at Cal Poly Pomona. And as I reflect on my career here, I only marvel how amazing life's journey could be. Born homeless, a refugee to a family made destitute by ethnic cleansing, I survived against terrible odds for at least two years in a one-room tent. And I know it was through the determination of my mother and the resilience of my father who had to eke out a living out of nothing that my family was able to make it. Determination and resiliency have become the modern Palestinian characteristics. But what ultimately set my family apart is education. The little primary school education that my parents received despite the colonial administration who shut down more schools than can be counted, including the one that my grand grandfather built to serve the children of our town, a town that was soon demolished, even before I was born, in an effort to block the refugees' return and to erase the memory of its people altogether. But here I am, oceans away from the place of my birth, I stand before you a proud member of the history department, surrounded by outstanding colleagues who individually and collectively have left their own mark on the university and on their own field of study. I want to thank the history department for collectively nominating me for this award. Having been a member of this department since 1989, my colleagues and I share almost a lifetime together. Our collegiality is reinforced by our principal position on shared governance, on academic freedom, on academic excellence, and on tolerance and open-mindedness. We care for one another, and we are honest with each other, and we always mean what we say all the time, because truth, honesty, and integrity are indivisible. These days, we need these qualities more than ever. We must make sure that knee-jerk reactions and prejudice should never be the grounds of academic policies. The best way we can serve our students and Cal Poly Pomona all together is to be sure that our policies and decisions are based on reasoned, carefully considered and thought out positions as our colleague George Hart would want us to do. This is an honor for me. I am very happy. Thank you to all my colleagues and my best wishes for a new academic year.
是。Thank you for such a befitting uh, recognition of his his accomplishments. At this time, I'd like to thank I'd like to invite, pardon me, Julie Shen, interim chair of the Academic Senate, and Professor Mohammed Ibrahim to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm really honored, and I want to make it very quick because I know there's a program. There are about 1,001 ways that I could use the money, but I think the best way is to turn it over to the history department and establish a prize for a history student who will receive the George P. Hart Award for something to be determined by our colleagues in the history department, for a senior or a junior. We haven't determined yet. I haven't told anybody about this yet. So, <laughs> so, yeah, Earlier, I promised you that we would spend a little more time focused on the graduation initiative. So I want to switch gears and ask the media team to please uh, return to the slides on the graduation initiative. Thank you. You make that so so look so easy and effortlessly. I know I know there's a lot of behind the scene work that goes on to make that happen. Um, what I want to do is begin by starting with an overview. How did we get here? Um, there have been a number of initiatives that have helped set, set the framework, the foundation for uh, the Graduation Initiative 2025. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time just highlighting them. In 2013-14, the CSU sponsored what they termed the CSU Academic and Student Success Program. And this was an allocation of $7.2 million in base funding to the CSU campuses to promote student success programs. Here at Cal Poly Pomona, we used our allocation to launch the EOP Summer Bridge, Poly Transfer, the Office of Undergraduate Research, and RISE, a residential program for African American students, a residential intensive summer education program, RISE. In 2013 14, the campus uh, adopted uh, the student success fee. This is a fee that every student, every matriculated student, both undergraduate and graduate, pays every quarter that they are here. There are a number of categories under this fee. This is the fee that is used to augment funding in the Learning Resource Center, enhance classroom equipment, library hours, advising services, clubs and organizations, and even the Rose Float. We have quite a number of advisors who are funded with this uh, source of funding. Pardon me. In 2015-16, the CSU and legislature funded another important initiative, the CSU Student Success and Completion Initiatives. These were six areas that the trustees identified as areas that needed further investment. And again, these were baseline allocations to the campuses. I can assure you 38 million didn't come to Cal Poly, but we certainly received our fair share of that allocation. Uh, part of that allocation 
the first initiative, and many, and I would argue the most important, is to increase tenured faculty hiring. Uh, Another critically important initiative under that banner, one that I also care very deeply about, given that I spent a big part of my own career running a university-wide advising center, is to enhance advising. There was funding under that initiative directed at bottleneck courses and improving the student preparation of our students as they come in to fund high impact practices and to also be much more data informed in our decision making. So these were the six strategic areas that were identified in the 2015-16 allocation. This year, 2016-17, Assembly Bill 1602 passed, and with it, a renewed emphasis on the CSU Graduation Initiative, which is being referred to as the Graduate Graduation Initiative 2025. The focus of Assembly Bill 1602 is to, on the four-year graduation rates for freshmen, and the two-year graduation rates for transfer students. We have, the, the, the bill includes 35 million in one-time funding. We hope to learn in the next day or two how much our campus will be receiving. The Board of Trustees are meeting this week and the presidents will get the word of how much of that 35 million they will be receiving. I think it's very important to emphasize that this is one time, and that if we can demonstrate with this investment that we can make deep and lasting differences in our own systems and structures, the hope is that this one-time allocation will move to become a baseline allocation to improve our graduation rates. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Assembly Bill 1602, our latest um, uh, round of investments from the CSU. As I said earlier, it's a $35 million allocation that will be distributed among all 23 CSU campuses. The goal is to raise the four-year graduation rates of our students. We have been benchmarked with a handful of other CSU campuses who are similar to us and have been given campus-specific goals for improving our graduation rates. Similarly, we are expected to increase our two-year graduation rates for transfer students. Um, and, and thirdly, we are expected to close, and the chancellors will say eliminate the gap between low income, first generation, and underrepresented minority students and the rest of the student population. These are very, very aggressive and ambitious goals for the campus, but I am convinced that there are many very successful programs that we can build on, but that there are also things that we can do together to reach these very, very important graduation goals. There are 24,000 reasons why this is our main priority this year. We have the largest incoming freshman class this year, over 4,000 students are coming in who will look to us to help them integrate into the culture of the campus, into their curriculum, and we owe it to those 24,000 students to help them achieve the goal that brought them here to Cal Poly Pomona. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the report that is available 
If any of you want to spend time understanding what is happening system-wide, what's being identified as best practices, this is a, a very helpful and useful report that I will invite you to, to, um, to review. And we're going to make sure um, that there are copies in the library so that uh, anybody can, can have access to these key reports. They, they summarize what's happening, the, the trends, but they, but they focus on some very important areas of recommendation. And in many ways, I think of this as the blueprint for how we can begin to organize ourselves around furthering the success that we've had on the campus in improving our graduation rates. As I said, preparation. We know that many of our students come in with uh, math and English scores that are below the college readiness levels. Uh, my own work, my dissertation, was on uh, students who uh, might otherwise be uh, sort of seen as at risk or predictions were that they would, would not succeed. And one of the things that the resiliency research shows is that if you get students who would, are at risk early on and move them through a pattern of coursework to address these areas of, of preparation or lack of preparation in key areas, you can, within a year, set them up for success and it's very difficult to differentiate them from the rest of the student population. But you have to be very intentional in identifying them and getting them the support that they need. A sense of belonging and connection is so important. I was a first generation college student and I remember what it felt like to be on a large campus. I didn't know anybody. I commuted in from, from home and, and really felt overwhelmed, lonely, lost and confused. And I know that there are many students who their first year have the same exact experience. And I hope as our freshmen and new students, uh, when they arrive later this week, that you will make it a point to reach out to them, to connect to them, to direct them to offices and service and classrooms that they're looking for, and to just help them feel welcomed. That sense of I belong here, there is a place for me here, is so incredibly powerful. Uh, academic support. We have a rich array of academic support programs, but we need to also be much more intentional in targeting those services and programs to those who need it the most. We also need to mediate the influence of socioeconomic differences. We know that our students struggle to pay for education. We've talked about the rising cost of textbooks. I hope that you will work with our librarians to find more affordable solutions, particularly around textbooks, because as textbook prices increase, our students find themselves unable to pay for the very tools and resources they need to succeed in the classroom. Finding and articulating clear pathways to degree and career is extremely important. I want to make sure that when we convert from quarter to semester, that all of us understand deeply that we are taking three terms and now stacking them up onto two terms and thinking through what that means in terms of prerequisites to ensure that our students have a clear pathway to degree that they can realistically complete in four years. Leveraging data. Data is extremely important in making informed decisions. There's a lot of choices and opportunities here. What I want to do is invite us to think about what does the data tell us? Have we asked students? Have we engaged in informant interviews to, to look at uh, what we can do better? We know that there are 
a number of administrative hurdles that we need to tear down. We need to work together to identify those hurdles and to eliminate them. And lastly, we need to evaluate our programs and our policies and make any necessary improvements. I want to give you now a glimpse at where we're at and what the Graduation Initiative 2025 um, uh, means for us very specifically. This is the Cal Poly Pomona data. On the right-hand side are our current most recent numbers. The, this is a cohort model, so it uses a group of students who begin together and tracks the extent to which an incoming cohort of freshmen can finish in four years, six years, and similarly how a cohort of transfer students finishes either in two or four years. And you can see that we've done a pretty good job. These are not bad numbers, but we can do better and the Graduation Initiative 2025 will invite us to move these percentages up. You can see that the biggest improvement will need to be in improving our four-year graduation rates for incoming freshmen. There's a lot of uh, attrition that happens in the first and the second year. And we need to understand what is happening there. And we need to get in front of that pattern so that we don't lose those, those incoming freshmen. We also will be uh, striving to close the uh, achievement gap, or, or what I like to refer to as the opportunity gap. Currently, there's a 13% gap or difference between Pell, underrepresented students, and the rest of the student population. And the goal is to completely eliminate that. Um, those percentages are not good. We have the highest, the fourth highest in the CSU uh, gap, the differential gap between our underrepresented students and other students. So this calls for very strategic approaches to closing that gap, identifying what are the needs of those students, and making sure that we have the supports, the programs in place for them. And similarly, when we look at Pell or financial assistance eligible students, currently there's an 8% gap, and the goal is to completely eliminate that gap. The next, the next slide provides a different view of this same data. On the right-hand side is the data for transfer students. On the left-hand side, the data for freshmen. And let's look at the freshman column, the column on, on closest to me. This uh, shows you the trend line over time, shows you the cohorts at the bottom. So the most recent cohort of freshmen started in 2011. And so in four years, we expect them to have graduated in 2015. And you can see that currently, uh, only 17.8% of our freshmen graduated in four years. And there is a 20% gap between that number and the green bar above. The green bar represents the 2025 goal uh, that we need to work towards. Below that uh, is, is also the freshman cohort. Um, the sixth year. So you can see we do better with a sixth year. Um, and I'm engaged with, with the chancellor's office to help them understand that we do have a number of five-year programs on the campus. We have engineering programs and an architecture program on the campus. And it's unrealistic to expect them to reach a four-year goal. We can do better even with architecture and engineering but I'm, I'm hoping that we can, we can convince the chancellor's office that, uh, th that uh, we need to be realistic in, in reaching these goals. On the right-hand column are the transfer numbers. At the top are the four-year rates. And again, you can see that 
uh, our best, more recent year was, uh, well, not our best year because there was something interesting that happened in 20, 2005 or so. I wasn't here then, so I don't know why we were so successful there, but currently the numbers are about 17%, and the goal is to take the freshman uh, four-year rate, transfer, pardon me, transfer rates to about 29%. Uh, below the four-year transfer rates, you can see we're doing better there, but we still have uh, room for improvement. The next table looks at the underrepresented students and the graduation gap that I referred to earlier. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, uh, analyzing it, other than to say the blue is the non-underrepresented minor minority population and the orange is the underrepresented groups. And you can see in each of the four graphs, orange trails blue. And we need to work to completely eliminate that gap. That is going to be a very, very important uh, part of our work. And you can see that the difference between orange and blue is especially pronounced with incoming freshman cohorts. So this is, a, this is our work. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that our first and foremost, the first goal on the list for academic affairs is our academic quality and our program. I want to be very clear that I am not standing here inviting us to lower our academic standards. My work in academic resiliency, my dissertation on this topic, has convinced me that, on the contrary, we need to have high expectations for all of our students. We need to help them reach those goals and provide them the support that they need to achieve their goals. As Vincent Tinto, a preeminent uh, writer in student development and student success wrote, no student rises to low expectations. We need to reach our students. We need to inspire them. We need to assist them to reach their goals. I think there are many of us in this room who are living examples of the difference that is made when we have high expectations of people and provide them the support, the scaffolding, and the mentoring they need to be successful. And that is the way I hope we approach the Graduation Initiative 2025. The next slide, please. As we approach this work, I think it's always helpful to keep things elegant. My staff knows that I, I, I like things that are elegant. When I, when, I mean, when I use the term elegant, I'm not talking about fancy or ostentatious. I'm talking about making complex information simple, intuitive. And so as we think about the graduation initiative, we are going to have to reflect on the people. Do we have the right people involved? The data. Are we using data effectively to inform our decision making? And thirdly, strategy. Are we doing the right things? And how do we know that they're working? So the people, the data, the strategies are going to be key components of our work in the graduation initiative. So I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the people the data and the strategies with respect to um, the dashboard that is available for us to use now. So the CSU Student Graduation Dashboard has been around for a while. And as part of the Academic Affairs Forum, we are going to be taking a deep dive into uh, the dashboard not all of you will want to go to the dashboard. We've, we've got a number of other presentations, but I want to make sure that everybody here has a good understanding of what is in the dashboard. 
And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Lisa Rotuni and her team for being pioneers. <laughs> For being pioneers and for raising their hand when invited to serve as a pilot campus for the CSU graduation dashboard, we need more and more of you to say, count me in. I'm, I want to be part of this important initiative. So I want to thank you for helping uh, us bring this dashboard here to Cal Poly Pomona. And in the interest of time, I want to now introduce um, a representative from the Chancellor's Office who will be uh, walking us through the features and some of the highlights of the dashboard. So let me jump back to my notes. And um, it, it, Desdemona is not here? OK. So we have with us. Um, I met him just recently, so I'm, I'm working here on long-term memory. Roy Stripling, who is from the Chancellor's Office, who has worked with uh, Desdemona Cardoza and other team members in the Chancellor's Office to develop the enhanced dashboard that we will be profiling today. So as I said earlier, we are a small group of campuses that have are piloting this for the first time, and I think that you will be wowed by what, what will be shared this afternoon. So let me not take any further time away from Roy and invite him to the stage. Good morning. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you have actually visited the uh, dashboard before? No, oh, fantastic. Um, you probably have noticed that uh, it has got a lot of data focused at the campus level uh, and system level, and that's been where we started uh, a couple of years ago when we launched this. Uh, and thanks to the efforts of Dr. Alva and uh, Lisa Rotini, we have uh, really been able to expand it recently, and that's what I want to show you, to provide uh, a whole set of new visualizations and data analyses that speak to data at the course, major, and department level, which we think will be of much more uh, practical use uh, especially for faculty, but also for staff who work with students, uh, really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to uh, improving student success. Uh, can I get the uh, dashboard up? Thank you. Uh, so this uh, will look familiar to many of you. This is the dashboard when you go to calstate.edu slash dashboard. Uh, if you're not already logged in through single sign-on, you'll get the single sign-on, and then you'll come to this home page. Uh, we're kind of masters of the, of the soft launch, uh, so we've already got the faculty, what we call the faculty dashboard on here. Um, which you can get to either by clicking on the departments and major link or by clicking this big box down here that says faculty. We really wanted to make sure faculty found this. Uh, but again, it's for anybody who's interested in data uh, at this level. Um, and what you'll find here, and actually before I, before I get to this, is, this is the landing page for the new dashboard. Uh, you can get back to the old dashboard by clicking that back button. Uh, I wanted to say again, uh, you know, this is, this, there's a lot of new data in here. It's broken down to a, a much more fine granularity than we've done in the past. Uh, and so you'll likely find uh, some data errors in a couple of places. And so if you do see something that doesn't look right, uh, we've tried to be very transparent about how we calculated this number. There's a whole section on every page about methodology. Uh, and if it still doesn't make sense what you're seeing versus what you know to be true, uh, there is a feedback link, link here on the home page. Uh, please let us know if you see something wrong, uh, tell us. We actually just showed the dashboard to folks at East Bay last week uh, and got a message saying that one of the majors wasn't on there and as of Monday it was on the, on the dashboard. So we really want to make this tool something that's useful for you, uh, but that's going to require just a little bit of, of effort on your parts where you see something that doesn't look right. Uh, so again, uh, this is, this is sort of oriented, the, you know, the landing page has kind of an intentional design, there's kind of a walkthrough process uh, that I'll take you through if it's your first time, it's sort of a way to get, get a sense of everything that's in here. But we've also set it up so you can, if you know what you're looking for, just jump right to uh, an individual page that has the data that you're interested in. Uh, so I will start with, you know, who are our students? This is basically demographic data, uh, a little bit of information about uh, how students are enrolling uh, in a term-by-term -term basis. Uh, on all the pages you'll see, uh, you know, a selection of your, your campus, 
the college and then the majors within that college. Uh, or in a couple of pages, instead of majors, it'll be departments, just because of the data that's being shown there. We currently have data for five campuses. We're going to be rolling out additional campuses as we go along. So this is also a way to look at uh, perhaps people who have a similar major in a different campus or courses, similar courses in another campus to see how they're doing uh, and how that relates to what you're seeing. Uh, on some of these, I'm going to just jump over to College of Engineering as an example. Uh, you can see you know, gender by enrollment, ethnicity by enrollment, also uh, unit load level, which is, of course, very much related to time to degree, and uh, enrollment at student level, so junior, seniors. Uh, all the way up, we're going to be adding in uh, post back as well. Uh, probably more interesting is looking at trends over time for this data. So, for example, engineering being a, a STEM field, you're probably very interested in gender enrollment, uh, the gender gap, as well as ethnicity enrollment. And so you can see, you know, for the, for the you know, college as a whole or for individual majors within the college, uh, you know, how trends have been going over time, are things improving? Uh, and you have knowledge of whether or not you're doing uh, anything active over these, these terms to, to say, okay, we're seeing a big improvement here, and maybe that ties, correlates to something that we've done. Uh, and again, you can look at other campuses to see if this is part of a broader trend or something particular to your campus. Uh, in, these, in all of the pages, you'll see, you know, eventually the first tab or two is our data visualizations. We provide the data in the table format as well, if you want to see, see the data in the table format. Uh, we have chart explanations, which are it's kind of designed as an FAQ, but you can also think of this as, as kind of your figure legend. So if you're seeing something you're not quite sure what we're, what, what we're showing or what, what, where the data came from, you can look here first. Uh, I mentioned also we, we also give a little bit of the methodology, so something more about where the data came from, how we've transformed it to, to, to uh, show what we're showing on the visualization, uh, and then some additional resources, information, things that you can do. So you're not just looking at data, but what can you do with the data if you, if you need a prompt for that. Um, So moving on to the next page, uh, we look also at uh, how your students uh, are progressing over time. And so this is the one uh, page in this dashboard that'll show individual student data. We, we, because we're showing campus, or campus data, or, or sorry, we're showing data for other campuses, uh, we're a little bit more concerned about FERPA than you might be on your own uh, campus dashboard, uh, where you can show, because you all have a, have a need to know, uh, data on individual students. Uh, so we, we shy away. You'll see some places, if you have a very small major, you'll get a message that says there are fewer than 10 students, so we're, so we're not showing the data. Uh, but here, the ex there's an exception. So here we're showing, uh, I'm going to show how individual students progress over a six-year period of time. Uh, in this case, I'll choose undeclared students, just to show you we can do something different. Uh, we have students just, in this case, entering as full-time, first-time freshmen. Uh, and we're going to look at all six different outcomes that you can potentially view. You can click these on or off if you want to look at a smaller set. Uh, and then you can see, animated over time, how those students progressed year by year. Uh, so you can see, you know, a, a good number of, under, of undeclared students dropped out in the first two years. Uh, and then, as, as they progress further along, you start to see graduations. Apologies for anyone in the room who's colorblind. Uh, we're going to work on a, on a little uh, indicator that will let you switch up the colors uh, or choose better colors. But green means you graduated. Red means you did not graduate. There's also a subtle difference in reds between whether you graduated within the major you started or you changed majors. Uh, but of course, if you started as an undeclared student you, and you graduated, you had to graduate in a different major than that. Um, Uh, next, uh, I'm going to show another visualization that looks at uh, how majors, how different uh, you know, migrations from one major to another. Uh, so here, let's just take a look at uh, hospitality management um, to mix it up a little bit. Uh, so here you're looking at, um, by selecting hospitality management, I'm looking at students who graduated with that major uh, and where they started when they entered. So you can see here, if you hover over, this, 181 students started, uh, of, the, of the students who started in, in hospitality management, 181 students went on to graduate, uh, which is 61% of the students who graduated with that major. And you can see all the other majors uh, that they came from. Uh, you can also view this uh, from the other way around. So you can look at students who started in hospitality management, how many of them transferred out and where they graduated. And again, this is just for students who graduated. We're not looking at other outcomes, although we're going to be adding that in uh, in the future. Uh, another visualization we've added in here, I think which, which will be particularly interesting, is looking at uh, non-passing grades in uh, co individual courses. And so here I'll uh, single out uh, math and statistics, since a lot of our students struggle 
uh, in math. Uh, and, and also, uh, so let me, actually, let me orient you on this chart first. We have on the y-axis just enrollment, uh, so it's the number of students. We have on the x-axis the percent of uh, non-passing grades, so it's D, F, unauthorized withdrawals, also I think incompletes are in included in here. Um, this right now is for all the academic, academic terms that we have data, but you can also select individual terms. Uh, and so what you see here is, and the size of the bubble is the number of students who got a non-passing non grade. Uh, and so we're, we're sort of highlighting the biggest, you know, the, the, the courses that impacted the most students. Uh, and if you hover over them, you can get specific data on which course that is, uh, as well as what the rates were and the number of students that were impacted by that. Uh, but you can also, uh, if you're more interested in uh, the courses that have a higher non-passing rate, uh, you, can, you can find those. You can also uh, click on and off uh, in the key to, to highlight, you know, just individual categories of courses. So you can just look at your sub back courses, for example. Uh, we don't provide specific guidance as to what, you know, what is a good uh, non-passing grade. That's, that's for you all to decide, right? You guys know uh, what is appropriate for your curriculum. Um, but we do call it the top three, and we just do this programmatically. So again, it's, uh, these are the ones that, have, that are impacting the most students. They may, not, they may not be the, the courses that you think uh, are most in need of attention. Uh, and we only show the top 50 courses, uh, so if there's a course, if your course is not making the top 50, first of all, congratulations. Uh, but also, you can click over to the data table if, you, if there's a specific course you want to find uh, and drill down there. Uh, we also take another look at course data, and here we're looking at uh, data that might be more relevant to the achievement gap. Uh, so we're looking, uh, instead of non-passing grades, we're looking just at uh, the, app, the GPA uh, within the course, the grade, the course GPA. And we're uh, separating uh, underrepresented minorities from non-underrepresented minorities. And so that's what you see here is, is the gap uh, here. Underrepresented minorities in this course, this is a higher level math course. Uh, you know, as a, this, this group has a GPA of 1.64, uh, whereas non-underrepresented minority students had a GPA of 2.53 or a gap of uh, 0.88 uh, in GPA. And there's only 48 students uh, in that course. Uh, you can, this is just looking at the largest achievement gap. You can also uh, look at a few other selections. So you could look at uh, just by largest enrollment. Uh, so the courses that are impacting the most students. And here you can see uh, Statistics 120 is, is uh, impacting a lot of students. It's, it's a smaller gap, but there's still a, a substantial gap there. Uh, and you can look also at uh, a combination of largest enrollment and largest gaps. So you might pull up a few different courses that way. Uh, we have an additional chart here that lets you look at individual ethnicities. So the gray bars, I'll just click all these off right now, uh, is just the average GPA in that course for all the students. Uh, and then you can look at individual uh, groups to see how they fell above and below that uh, average. Uh, here again, we have an M minus 10 rule. So in some cases, you might find uh, you know, uh, African American students, for example, not showing up because there were fewer than 10 students who took that course in that term. Uh, lastly, uh, our last data page, uh, looking at academic outcomes. So again, um, I'll, I'll call out uh, hospitality management um, to show the very nice numbers. Uh, so here you can see graduation rates, four year and six year uh, for freshmen. Uh, you can also look at transfers uh, on this page as well. Um, and just for a point of comparison, looking at the, the campus-wide rates for four year and six year graduation rates, you can look at persistence in first through six year uh, to see how those compare. Uh, also, just as additional pieces of data, the number of units earned at graduation, uh, and the average GPA at graduation. And as with the first page I showed you, you can see this over time as well to see if this is a consistent trend or things are improving or not improving. Uh, one thing I want to mention, you know, when you come to this site, there's a lot of data here. It's available to you. It's, it's we hope, very easy for you to get, get at. Uh, there's also a lot of data that's not here. So as you come here and, and you want to involve uh, we, we hope you use this to, to create and, and sustain data-driven conversations about strategies that you can use to improve student success. But obviously, when you get here, uh, the first question you should be asking yourself is, what am I seeing and what is not here? What, do I, what should I be seeing? So for example, right now, we don't have any first-generation uh, data in there. We don't have any data uh, on this part of the dashboard uh, for Pell, uh, students who receive Pell grants, those sorts of things. Those are things we're working to get in, but those are really important pieces of information you might want to know. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, you know, other campuses you might want to compare yourself to that aren't in this dashboard yet. Uh, there's a lot of student level data that you might want to see that we don't have. We don't, uh, on the course, uh, you know, the, the course uh, data visualizations, we don't provide data down to the section level. So if you want to break it down even further to see if there's a difference between sections, you'll have to do that within your department or work with uh, IR uh, to get that data. Uh, lastly, 
Uh, I'm going to show one more page. Uh, we wanted to make it a little easier to uh, take away some of the information that you saw, uh, and so we made this sort of interactive uh, action plan page, and we're, we're in the process of probably revising this to make it even more uh, helpful. But one of the things you can do is, you know, you can select your, again, your, your uh, campus college and major, and you, if there's a, a couple of pages in particular you were interested in, you can pull it down, uh, get a quick summary of some of the salient facts uh, that were presented on that page here, in this case, in text form, uh, some prompts about how, you know, if, if, if you don't already know how you want to use this data, uh, some prompts about how you might use the data or conversations you might start or who you might talk to, uh, and then just some links and further resources. Uh, this is actually data pulled from uh, the Merlot.org site. Uh, so in some cases there are research articles, in some cases there are other, uh, you know, teaching aids that you can use or teaching uh, practices that you can employ to, to address the information relevant to that page and you can pull down multiple pages and have these, uh, you know, click through them. Uh, we're in the process of making this something you can download as a PDF, but right now you can use your browser uh, print function to, to print these as a PDF or to, to send them to other folks if you wanted to share them. Uh, I think there, you know, there's going to be, as, as was mentioned before, uh, an opportunity to get your, to get your hands on it uh, today. I'll be uh, sort of manning a, a hands-on station, so if you have specific questions, you can do that. Um, and uh, again, I just want to reiterate: if you do see something in here uh, that doesn't look right to you and you can't make sense of it, please shoot us a quick quick note. We really want to make this some, a tool that's very useful to you. And if you think there's data in there that's not accurate, clearly you're not going to use it. Uh, so. Thank you very much for your time. And actually, I don't know if I have a couple minutes, but maybe some questions, uh, if there's anything. Nope. Yeah. Yep. Question. Sorry. Question, yes. Uh, in terms of the gap, um, the predictors of that gap, uh, do you account for or somehow balance out uh, access to like, dual enrollment programs and uh, AP classes in terms of Yeah, so in terms of how we graduate four year, oh sure, so I think the question was, uh, uh, was a question about the gap and how we calculate the gap and how do we account for uh, units that students bring in uh, when they come in, so AP, AP units is one example. Uh, and, and I think, essentially I think the gap is, is calculated without considering that, although that is something that can uh, essentially help someone graduate faster and, and uh, effectively increase their, their, their parent graduation rate or their time to degree. Um, we're actually uh, in the process of, of designing a whole bunch of new pages, refining essentially the, or redesigning the, essentially the original dashboard. And one of the things we're going to include is some analyses on uh, different things that, that uh, would allow students to graduate faster and some of the different factors that would include that. Uh, also looking at students who uh, took, you know, four years plus one term and how many students essentially just missed that mark, or five years plus one term, or six years plus one term, and are there, you know, what, what, are the, what are the percentage of folks that we might sort of identify as low-hanging fruit and hitting some of those goals, and uh, just, just as a preview of that, we did an analysis system-wide and found that we could actually increase four-year graduation rates by about seven or eight percentage points, uh, just by, if, if we were able to address all the things that, that cost somebody to graduate in four years plus one term instead of uh, four years. So some of that might be coming, coming to school with more, with more units. Some of it might be uh, starting with a full load that first term or two terms instead of just being a full-time student. So making sure they take enough uh, units that first term, uh, which a lot, of, a lot of students, I think, are a little wary to do. They don't, they're concerned that they're going to be overwhelmed with work in those first terms or two, and so they take a lighter load uh, than perhaps they needed to. Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Maybe we'll allow two questions only. Remember, there's a workshop right after this. Um, as an, under, as an underrepresented minority myself, I was thinking um, and about this data and something that kept bothering me a little bit. And um, I find a little bit problematic this focus on underrepresentative minorities, and then the benchmark that is put, that is um, basically people who are not underrepresentative minorities, especially if uh, the benchmark is how Caucasian white people do 
versus not white people. Um, I think that maybe we should have put the standard of what a passing is. What is the standard that, that we want our student to reach? And then focus on those students who are not meeting this standard. Because then we will shift focus on people of color who are not meeting this standard and also help students who are Caucasian and who are not meeting this standard. Um, I think then that presents other uh, conversations. Like for example, um, when the provost mentioned that she's not um, arguing for lowering the standards, um, I can see why the need to make that, that comment. Because then the question is, which is something I have heard from other people is, um, how do we need to change the standards so that people of color will make it? So can we change the focus versus, uh, and change it from represented under, under, from underrepresented minorities versus majority or whatever. I think there is a rationalization there that I don't think should be the focus. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, first of all, thank you. Uh, second of all, we're having those same conversations uh, at the chancellor's office. If Desdemona were here, she's actually leading uh, the charge on coming up with, as you say, addressing more directly the, the obstacles and barriers uh, that, are, that those students who, who have been underserved uh, as they came up through the K-12 through system, for example, uh, are facing. Uh, in, the, in the original dashboard, you'll see a lot of data on the proficiency at entry uh, measures that I think more directly address some of the issues uh, as to why some of our students don't do as well as others. Uh, I think, uh, and we're going to be working that into the, to this new section of the dashboard as well as we get uh, our data uh, in a format that, that will allow us to do that. Uh, we are having the same conversations about, uh, you know, underrepresented minority. The, you know, it's, it, those, it has a lot of issue, it has a lot of baggage, as, as you described. Uh, and, and we're looking at ways to allow you, essentially, to make this tool more flexible to uh, pull out the groups that you want to look at. Uh, so there's, cause there's a number of ways that, that students come to us who have been underserved by, by the community, by, by the state. Uh, and we want to be able to identify who those students are and, and give them the support they need, uh, regardless of their ethnicity. Um, and, and that also reminded me, one other thing I, I wanted to say uh, is, you know, again, at the Chancellor's Office, I wanted to reiterate, we are very much committed to uh, meeting our students where they are, uh, not changing our, our admission standards, not changing the way, you know, who we bring in, uh, but really supporting our students as they're here, and at the same time also protecting the rigor of the education and the learning that our students uh, come to us to receive. Um, and you guys uh, are... are you know, really the, the most important piece of that. You protect the rigor of the academic education that they receive uh, by invigorating your pedagogy, by employing the high impact practices, by uh, keeping the curriculum uh, up to date and relevant, uh, and, and we support that. And, and hopefully this tool uh, will be used in a way that supports that as well. Question. Is there another question? Okay, then I think we can go to the provost. It's to avoid the mic. I just want to, I want to thank Roy for inviting you to contact the Chancellor's Office if you have questions or if you see something in the data that's not there. But I also want to invite you definitely to contact our own Office of Institutional Research and Academic Resources because we've been working with them on this data. We'll be happy to communicate. And maybe it's a simple question we can deal with very quickly over the phone instead of waiting for a, an answer back from, from Roy and his team. So I want to make sure you know that. You are invited to contact us. Yeah, absolutely. The, the data we have in here all came from Lisa's office. Uh, so we started with Lisa. We, we you know, worked into these different analyses. We, we sent it back to Lisa to, to, to double check it. Uh, but there's just so much data in here, and it's being done in ways that haven't been done before. There, you know, as with East Bay, there's going to be something that, that we missed. Um, and, and so 
if you send it to us, we're going to contact Lisa to make sure we get it right. Uh, but, but do, yeah, absolutely always uh, work with your IR department. They have a lot of resources uh, um, uh, and, and a, lot of a lot of things they can do for you that, that we can't do. Hi, I'm Peter Kilduff in the Apparel Merchandising Management Department. Well, that echo is difficult to deal with. <laughs> um, a point I want to make is um, uh, a lot of our students want to study part-time because they're working their way through college. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that when we look at graduation rates for four years and two years. So we've got to build that into expectations that a lot of students are studying part-time so they can pay their way through college and graduate without being under a mountain of debt. I don't really have an answer to that. I will say you're right. There are a lot of students that do that. It's, it's, it can be a very rational choice for a student to make to be part-time, to graduate in five years, six years, seven years. Um, but we want to make sure that they have all the information they need uh, to make that decision, uh, which, which may, as you say, be very, very much appropriate for their condition and their circumstance. Yeah. Roy, thank you very much. The questions uh, really underscore the importance of engaging an entire campus around these very important questions. Again, I'll underscore, it really is about creating opportunities, supporting students to reach their own goals on their terms. We know that many of our students are under financial aid and need to make reasonable progress toward their degree or they will lose that financial aid. And similarly, as a parent of a daughter who took longer than I expected, uh, and when I began to ask why she was not graduating, I learned that it was because she didn't have that career, that job lined up, and this became her holding pattern. So we really need to think about how to help our students make the transition from the university to the world of work and career or graduate education. So there are lots of opportunities to jump into this conversation. But we uh, are running out of time in, in terms of the rest of the program. And I want to make sure that we have ample time to um, launch you into the various workshops that we've organized for you. So we have a workshop on Quality Matters course design framework used uh, to enhance student success. Again, quality matters. Academic standards are important. Victoria Babsar will be leading a conversation on quality matters in this building at the per per Perseus Room. Um, advising matters. And so Terry Gomez, Nina Neto and Jean Almarez will be leading a conversation on how do we advise for student success in this building in the Andromeda room. Uh, and there will be a conversation led by Sepp Eskandari, Lisa Rotuni, Roy Stripling in the University Library, second floor, room 2907, which is a continuation of the student success dashboard. And it's being scheduled in the library to give you direct access to the dashboard so that you can roll up your sleeves and start looking at the data that is of direct interest to you. I want to just close this portion of the program by reminding all of us that we are one team with one goal, and that is student success. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for being part of this very important conversation. We'll keep in touch. <laughs>